Welcome to Design Downtime, the podcast where we celebrate the joys of living a balanced, creative life. I'm your host, Guy Siegel, a design director in Toronto, Canada, and I invite you to join me on this journey as we redefine what it means to be a successful design professional. Let's break free from the shackles of hustle culture and embrace the full spectrum of human experience because life is too precious to be spent only in pursuit of productivity. Today, I'm delighted to be talking with Val Poon. As a curiosity and UX-driven product designer, Val experiments with sensory-rich elements to create digital experiences that captivate and communicate intuitively. Her superpower lies in keenly discerning the right timing to act on user and business needs, much like navigating through waves when surfing. Now learning to code, Val is looking forward to deepening her understanding of our ever-evolving digital landscape. A gentle reminder for listeners from Val is to embrace every moment because then your journey unfolds into a rewarding map of destinations. Welcome to the show, Val. Thanks, Guy. How's it going? It's going well. And today you want to talk to us about surfing. Yes. All about surfing. So as you know, I like to start with the origin story. So where does surfing come into the picture for you? Mm-hmm. It's actually interesting because I grew up in concrete jungles. Early on in my life, I lived in Hong Kong for a bit. Um, and we all know it's pure concrete and very tall concrete, maybe with like glasses and different. But we won't get technical there. And then once I moved back to Canada, I still lived relatively close to the city. Uh, however, on weekends, my mom did bring us to the ocean. And through news, I would see a woman surfer kite surfer to be or wind surfer to be exact and something about her and something about the ocean and the way she moved in it really intrigued me so I just kept thinking about surfing growing up even though I was far away from that environment in my day-to-day how old were you um for as long as I can remember I would say probably around like grade one I started like at night going to bed thinking about like one day I hope I become like a surfer. I'll I'll start visualizing myself surfing even though I I knew nothing about how to. And then I think even after moving back to Canada in around grade six, I distinctively remembered there was a little bracelet with a yellow surfboard on it at uh, this camp that I went to at U of T. And I just wore it like it was like my, my, I don't know, my little charm that I'll like carry around to remember that one day, like I will make this happen. When did it come? The day of actually surfing. Yeah. Um, I, this is kind of sad, but I can't remember. <laughs> but I do remember my first time ever surfing was in Hawaii, I want to say, uh, with my high school best friend. Uh, we traveled quite a bit together early on and when we finally got to go to Hawaii together, we were like, we got to go surfing. And that was it. Like that was the first time I've ever surfed. It was tough. I loved it. The water was very salty, but what was the most rewarding and strangely rewarding moment was um, having a granola bar after the surfing session. I used to not like granola bar and like oats. I'm like, ew, like it's so healthy. How is this a snack? How is this a dessert? But then after that one surfing session, the water was so salty. Uh, We were working very hard in the water to learn how to even just balance ourselves that it made that simple granola bar so good. And ever since then, whenever I can go on vacation, it's always like the baseline is always, where can I go surfing next? So I want to talk more about that first session. You said when you were a child and you were, you know, you saw that windsurfer and that kind of like got you excited about the magical world of surfing that one day you're going to get to. And then the day comes and you're, I'm assuming you're taking some lessons, surfing lessons in Hawaii? Yes, it was a lesson. It was a semi-private lesson with my best friend. And you have an idea in your mind and it's kind of like, the way we, you know, every time we want to do something where we learn something for the first time, there's this ideal in our head, how we're going to do it and we're going to be amazing at it. And then reality hits. Tell me about that first lesson. The first lesson, it was very hot because it was like peak season in Hawaii. The waves weren't 
very steady, so that made it very hard to focus. There was a lot coming at you at once. Like when you watch movies or clips of people surfing, it seems so elegant, so graceful, so relaxing. But re in reality, when you're in the moment, especially when you're just learning, it's exactly what like what you said, guy. Like it's everything but that. Like I remember the water being super shaky. Getting up was way harder than I thought because I've never exercised prior to surfing before. I was always like more of a an artist, like sit at home studio type introvert. Um, so that was um, quite a lot of reality to face all at once. Good thing about it is, yes, we worked very hard in the water, but it was sweat free because the water was nice and cool. So that was great. Another interesting part that I didn't anticipate is the coral reefs being like the bottom. I imagined before it was like a soft fall. I don't have to be that careful, but actually when it's coral bottom, like getting cut by coral can lead to really bad bacterial infection. So that was um, something to be aware of as well. What else can I think of that was far from reality? Oh yeah, popping up took forever. Like I I think during the two session to get a two hour session together, I've only popped up like for like five seconds or ten seconds max, uh, maybe like four times. So that was yeah, that was a huge learning curve, but I loved every moment of it. So we have that first two hour session. Mm -hmm. And even though you only popped out for, you know, for a few seconds, you have your your incredible uh, granola bar afterwards. Mm -hmm. The best. What was that feeling after that first session? How did you feel about, did it change anything about your perception of surfing? Mm -hmm. It changed for the better. It gave me a reality check in a good way where it wasn't a dream anymore. It wasn't something that was just in my head. It was now my reality. Like I've done it, it was hard, but I wanna do it again. Um, so it really validated that like vision I had early on in my head, matching my reality, my feeling, my uh, sensory systems, like everything just felt aligned um, with a little bit of like bumps and like things that I didn't anticipate, but in a good way because now it feels tangible. So now it becomes something that you're, you've actually done and tried. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking of the next time? Oh, I'm always thinking about the next time. The reason why I get so excited to get up every day is literally because I know no matter how the day goes, I have one more day to go surfing. So after the first time in Hawaii, what is the next surfing session you have? Good question. I am terrible with dates, but I will do my best right now to recall the timeline. After Hawaii, oh, I want to say it was Hong Kong where um, I lived and where my grandma lives right now. So I believe I was visiting her and then I discovered that near her house, um, it only takes a solid one and a half hour hike to this hidden like cove or beach to go surfing. Um, and so that changed Hong Kong's like, per like my my perce perception of Hong Kong completely from a concrete jungle to a concrete jungle with hidden gems where I can go surfing here and there. Um, it's a very convenient city to move around to because the public transportation is just phenomenal and very safe and quick. So yeah, Hong Kong, I believe, is was my next stop and continues to be my stops whenever I can make a stop there to visit my grandma. So now that you're you're a surfer, you know, after those sessions, you are a surfer and you're you keep having this goal of okay, when is my next surfing vacation? When is the next opportunity I get to be in the ocean? Mm -hmm. Does that have any effect on you? Are you getting more into, I would say, surfer culture? Mm -hmm. Um funny enough, I feel like we can all relate to this as professionals. I got imposter syndrome early on because like, yeah, as we talked about like surfing, the learning curve is huge and it's something that you need to practice daily, honestly, to hone in on or else like a lot of my vacations, um, especially the first day or two when I jump back into the water from being um, on land for so long is that I have to suck first, the couple first days, couple few hours because ocean and waves are unpredictable. It's different every day. They're never the same. Um, so constantly putting myself back into that helped me 
learn the skill of how to ride the waves of imposter syndrome. And so I used to be afraid to identify myself as a surfer, but yeah, confidently I can say I do surf. So therefore I'm a surfer now. Uh, Surfer culture is different everywhere. So when I was in San Francisco, it was actually really warm. I met people in the parking lot. I met my uh, surf coach friends and they um, invited me to a barbecue after set like the session, which I know SF sometimes get like the opposite rep that people are like always go go go. Like I actually met quite the opposite when I went surfing there, mm-hmm, which was just fascinating. And I think about it all the time. Um, and then there's like SoCal where I lived for a couple months in Los Angeles and did my exchange studies there, which funny enough, you think everyone from LA surfs. I literally met most people and like maybe one or two has even tried surfing or does actually surf. And the culture there was, I can't really pinpoint because I think like a lot of locals don't actually surf and a lot of people don't actually come from or were born and raised there, they moved there for a different reason, for like entertainment, you know, industry. So I didn't really feel a strong culture there. Maybe if I wasn't in LA and I was in like Orange County or somewhere else, I would have felt the strong surf culture, but I couldn't really pinpoint what it felt like there. Um, Hong Kong was very small because that place is go, 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 and surfing is a luxury there. Um, So it was more old school because of the coach that I chose he's very like you got to ride a short board long boards are for noobs like I don't teach that I don't welcome them but then when I was in Hawaii there were long borders and there were people that surfed all their life so it was much more chill culture there that I met but I was also in like a tourist area so hard to gauge where else have I served I feel like I'm missing oh Japan 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 I don't have an answer yet because I went to this small little island called Inoshima and I was only there for one day, so cannot gauge what the culture is like, but I had a good time. Of those places, which ones were your favorite? Oh man, they're all so different. I can't pick favorites. That's the toughest question ever, guy. They're all good for different reasons, but if I were to have to just pick one overall, oh my God, that's so tough. I'm just going to have to say San Francisco, to be honest, because I saw a whale there and it was a special moment for me. Yeah. And the people were just not what I expected. In in what way? Super friendly, super relaxed, down to earth. Yeah. And how can you not remember seeing a whale while you're surfing, right? Even the whale was welcoming. That was, yeah, that's surf culture. (laughs) How far from the whale were you? Um, I want to say... It felt like I was looking at it from like across the street in Toronto. But honestly, in reality, I think like my perceptions warped and it's pretty far away. But I'll say this. I saw its mouth opening and then like why I recognized it and saw it in the first place is because a bunch of seagulls were going at it, meaning like it was eating and they were sharing food. And so, yeah, close enough for me to observe all those details that I mentioned. So I want to get back to something because I talk to a lot of people and there's different hobbies and interests. And someone, for example, you know, I talk to someone who loves riding a bike and they do it on a daily basis almost. And so they're, you know, they're someone who rides a bike. When we're talking about surfing, since you don't really, you know, live on the ocean and you do it on a daily basis, it's kind of like a a special occasion and aspirational aspect. How does being a surfer come into play on a daily basis when you're not surfing every day oh my god it leads into everything like i cannot unthink about surfing like i cannot i can like leave you know like i we all know like as designers or creatives like we have so many things that we want to do and try but i'm as i grow i'm able to just cross out like no i don't want to try this anymore it's fine Um, But surfing, I cannot do that. I know that very well. And it bleeds into me, my daily habits, how I deal with uncertainty, how I deal with um, health, fitness, mental health, emotions, um, thoughts. I can go off about everything. It's just, it's life changing. Um, But do you want to dive into any of these things that I mentioned? Which one would you like to start with? Whichever one you want to start with. 
Okay, uh, let's start with the most powerful one for me, which is recognizing that I can approach feeling my emotions like a surfer with waves. And so as a designer and an artist, I am very sensitive, very emotional. And those two things are things that I struggled with a lot growing up. I didn't know how to deal with it. And so that's why I was more introverted because I would bottle up and it was not great. And things would accumulate, turning into so from little waves accumulating to a big one. And then it would just wash over me and I'd feel like I'm under and drowning. Um, but what I had to learn as a surfer is like um, how to detect and read your emotions like waves. How to see the big one that's coming. And how to observe your emotions rather than being your emotions. Separating that. And knowing and recognizing just like waves, their sizes, their frequency, and sets that come and how they pass you. Like a surfer, you are not your emotions, but your emotions are signals for you. And you can ride, they will pass. And uh, you just need to be a good observer and know how to respond rather than react when you uh, feel your emotions. Have you found surfing made you a more patient person? Oh my God, absolutely. So yes, surfing is relaxing because a good chunk of it, I want to say 80% um, is waiting for and waiting for a wave. And by waiting, I'm not saying just to daydream and not be observant and just close your eyes. I'm talking about you're looking at the ocean, the horizon. You're trying to observe light and shadow um, to find the perfect way for you. And the perfect way for you is different for everyone and every stage and phase and even your energy for the day. Um, because if it's a beautiful wave, a big, giant, tall wave, but you're just starting out like me, you have to let it pass. And like that actually goes into a little bit of how I see life as well with opportunities. Like you can't really control what opportunities come at you at what, what time and when. Um, but what you can control is how you prepare for it, how you gauge if it's the one for you or it's not the one for you. And yeah, just it's just good. It's been really good to think of life that way. What surfing locations that you haven't been to are you most looking to explore? Oh my God. I'm always thinking about that. That list is always changing too. But as of right now, Bali is top on my list because my uh, I have family members that grew up there and so I'm very curious about the actual culture itself beyond surfing. Um, I also know that they have a lot of fruits and I love fruits so I would love to go there and animals and plants. Um, so yeah, first one on my list is Bali. It's also known as like the digital nomad hub um, so that's why I really want to learn more about that lifestyle. Uh, second on my list, which I'm trying to make happen, is Costa Rica. I'm trying to learn Spanish right now. Just going to put this out there publicly so I can get some positive peer pressure to learn Spanish finally. And yeah, check that out. That spot, again, is known for like the digital nomad hub. So it would just fit perfectly in with my lifestyle. And Spanish culture is just generally speaking so warm. And they're so good at like, I'm generalizing here, but dealing with tough situations with a smile and lots of laughters and good humor. So I would love to learn more from them directly and go surfing there in the meantime. Third on my list, it's a tie between New Zealand because of nature and the landscape there and Africa because I, I love big animals. Like the bigger, the better. They're just so cool. So if I can see well, I probably wouldn't want to see a shark when I go surfing there, but I would love to see manta rays and sharks on a different day when I'm not surfing there. So South Africa and New Zealand would be the, a tie between the two for my third place. Since this is an audio medium, people can see the, uh, you know, what's behind you on the wall. But if you can tell me more about that sort of planner you have on the wall behind you. Oh, yes. So as someone that has endless ideas and endless curiosity, something that I deal with or something that I do to to deal with myself, <laughs> for lack of better words, is I create like lists. And like, I don't, I've learned that it doesn't, my, my list is not a to-do list because that becomes 
unhealthy when you just keep stacking up ideas and you just see a long receipt of things that you haven't done yet. It's not very healthy for you. So what I've learned is to shift my mindset to think of my to-do list as a tada list. Like if I do it, it's going to be like, tada, I did it. But if I didn't, it's fine. It's just, I don't get to say tada. <laughs> and so it's a mix of things that I want to do, things that I want to achieve, ways that I want to feel, actions that I want to change, and patterns that I want to establish or reestablish. Yeah. And then as you can see, it's all smudged and um, some are kind of clear and carved out. Some are just like the little wave that you can see with no words yet. Yes. And that's exactly why it caught my attention because on that list, there's a drawing of a wave that has no date or destination next to it, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Looking back at, you know, where we started, where that, you know, you saw that windsurfer and it caused that aspiration. He had an ideal of, I'm going to be doing that one day. And now you have multiple times. Mm -hmm. What has surprised you about the journey so far? Oh, that's a powerful question to ask. I like that a lot. Aspiration versus when it becomes a reality. I think gratefulness would be the good word to sum it up. And the power of believe, and then believing in yourself, believing in your vision, believing the world, believing in action. Those would be my answers for that question, that great question. That is beautiful. I'm curious if you want to try like surfing now. That would be my question for you. That is a really good question. I am personally very bad when it comes to balance. I've done a bit of kind of like boogie board surfing when I was a child. So not real, not real in any way. It is real. I've never done it. I've always wanted to. But not really since. I mean, Lake Ontario is not the most, you know, wave heavy location on earth. I'm well aware. <laughs> I've tried though. Actually, that's the one I forgot to mention. I tried surfing in Ontario there. But back to you, Guy. No, so I have no immediate plans, but I'm not ruling it out. Amazing. When you're ready, let me know. I will give you all the information I know that can set you on the right foot. Thank you so much. <laughs> Val, where can people find you? I like to be off screen because I like to be in nature and um, be inspired by life and little details I notice about the world. So LinkedIn would be the only place, if not my website. That is extremely outdated. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the invite. I've been looking forward to this day, Guy. Thank you. This is all for this episode of Design Downtime. Thank you for joining me. And until next time, I hope you enjoy your downtime.